Well, hello, my name's Johnny. If you're new here, so am I. So we're in the same boat. By the way, that's the best calendar video ever. No fancy graphics. Let's just sit at the board. That's why I love Jeremy, just as it is. And I picked up on this thing that I don't know if you picked up. You're having a party on Shady Lane for families. Shady Lane for families. Just want to, like, maybe we need to process the street name. Like, could we have a party at, like, Fun Lane or something like that? We're we are in Acts chapter 19. We've been in Acts for a little while now, and Chad, my, one of my dearest friends, opened it up talking about the Holy Spirit, and you heard Jeremy last week, and you heard, if you were here a couple weeks ago, I was here, and we're going to continue that in Acts chapter 19. So if you have your Bibles, this is that moment where we stare at each other just for a minute, just like in a weird stare, where I wonder if you're going to do this or not, but I'm not sure. Um, if you have a phone, pull it out right now, grab your phone. And because I need you to see a copy of the scriptures. Here's two reasons. One, I need to confess that I got several verse like things wrong last hour and because I don't proofread really well. So uh, you need to make sure that the pastor is saying actually what's in the word of God, um, even when he uh, should have his wife look over his slides the night before. So we fixed them. So let, you, know, you guys are getting like you should be getting the good. So I want you to have your eyes on scripture because it's really easy it's easy to just hear the word of God, but you need to like practice and read for yourself. And if you have a vintage uh, Bible, that's like the old, old school printing, um, if you're still there. Acts chapter 19, if you are new and you're like, what is Acts and why are we in chapter 19? The story of the church begins in Acts from the very beginning. If you want to know how we got here, this is where the story begins. And you can see the beginning and the roots of the church. And so in Acts, there's some incredible things have happened. Acts chapter 19 is taking place over in a place called Ephesus in modern day Turkey. And one of the main dudes is Paul. And Paul has a crazy story in itself. I encourage you to check out. He used to be a man, a, like he would prosecute Christians and put them in jail and endorse the killing of Christians. And then he like met Jesus and he was transformed. Well, he is in Ephesus and we've been learning about all of the movements of Jesus that he kickstarted with the Holy Spirit. And so here we are in Acts chapter 19. We're going to put some verses on screen today, some we're not, but I want to kick off in verse uh, 17. And, and then I'm going to put 18, 19 on the screen. It says, the story of what happened spread quickly all through Ephesus to, G, to, to Jews and Greece alike. Let me, is this on? Am I good? Okay, we're good. You can everybody hear me? Okay. Just had a moment. It's fun. Let's start over. The story of what happened spread quickly through Ephesus to Jews and Greeks alike. A solemn fear descended on the city, and the name of the Lord Jesus was greatly honored. Now, so there's a movement happening. I wanted you to hear that because this is the response that some believers had. Many who became believers, verse 18 there, confessed their sinful practices. A number of them who have been practicing sorcery, brought their incantation books and burned them at a public bonfire and the value of the books was several million dollars. So the message about the Lord spread widely and had a powerful effect. I want to start today, we're going to continue asking questions as we have been all series long, but I want to start today by having a question that I want you to ask one another, okay? What was the earliest memory you have of having to confess something you've done wrong? Like, let's just have a moment, go back into your, you know, like when you blew it and you had to say it to your mom and dad or your teacher or whatever. I want you to take a moment with the person right or left. If you don't know them, say, hi, this is my name. I'm about to confess something that this forget about after we leave here. So take a moment, do that first hour. It was great. Second hour, I want you to rock into this. When's the earliest moment you remember confessing something that you did wrong? On your mark, get set, go. Right. I know. I know. What is this joker asking us to do at church this morning? Yeah, it's the louder you talk, the less people can hear. There we go. This is good. Okay. Is 
Some of you have been waiting 20 years to say that. Okay, that's good. All right, so hopefully you've had a chance to share uh, your deepest memory of when you had to confess. Mine goes back to when I'm a kid. How many of you guys shared a memory from your, your childhood? Anybody? Okay, so I, I remember the first time I had to confess as a kid, like it was yesterday. Uh, growing up, we went to this place called Bilo Foods, and Bilo was just a grocery chain, just like Kroger. And when you're a mom trying to check out at a grocery store, they stack the deck against you. Because what do they do? They put candy throughout the entire checkout. That's just wrong, y'all. Like now that I'm a dad and I had to go through that line, like it's just like, come on, man, we just need to get out. We're trying to buy these things. And what do we do? Like as a kid, I'm bored. I just, doot, doot. I'm staring literally at candy. It's like that noise is like put me in a trance. And all I want to do is ask the question, can I have, can I have? And what do you think my mom's answer was? Yeah, you know the script, right? Like we know how this dance goes. And so, but there's Kit Kats, m and Snickers, but there was one candy that ruled them all for me when I was a little boy. I want to put a picture on screen of my favorite candy. It was, guess, anybody, anybody, yeah, some of y'all, yeah, you know, forget about the Snickers. You want this. Okay. This is a whistle pop. This was OG awesome candy. They used to make candy like real candy. All right. Like I'm pretty sure that whatever sugar content was in here is not from earth. (laughs) And so everybody wanted the whistle pop for two reasons. One, lots of sugar. Two, it makes noise. And so I would always pull out the whistle pop and I would ask my mom and dad or whoever was at checkout at the time, my mom the most, and just said, can I have one of these? She said, no. And then that dance would go on for a long, until I decided to take matters into my own hands. She was distracted one time going in there. So I reached over and grabbed the whistle pop and just put some in my pocket. Now, at the time, we drove what I would call a conversion van, okay? And it was a big van, good seats in the back. And when I would sit in the very back, it felt like my mom was way far away, like a mile away from me. It felt like that. So I thought it was the perfect time on the ride home to enjoy the spoils of my theft, which is the whistle pop, except as I was doing that, I forgot one thing. Do you know the one thing I forgot? Yes, I was not a good thief. And so I, I started enjoying the whistle pop and I started blowing. And then I heard like my mom say in that mom voice, what was that? And what was my answer? Yes, you've, you've actually gotten that script before. (laughs) You've said that before, right? Like, it's just something in us from the Garden of Eden. Like, I don't know, we got programmed nothing into our soul. Like, nothing. Like, no, there was something. And we just went to this dance back and forth until finally, when we got home, she saw, and I had to own up, and I I had the whistle pop. She turned around, and we drove all the way back to Buy Low Foods, and I had to walk in and look at the manager and stare at him and confess my crime. It was a humbling moment. We have a really fascinating relationship with confession. I mean, for the most part, I think most of us would say, I don't like it. Because it's usually tied to consequences or doing something wrong. Or, you know, when we get in trouble and we have to say what happened. And we just have this weird, strange relationship with confession. But yet confession is supposed to be a powerful part of our life as believers. And so this morning, one of the first questions we're going to ask coming out of that scripture is, what do you have to confess? What do you need to confess? In the scripture, these believers, their response, their natural response was to confess. And maybe in the beginning, we had a baptism first hour, praise God. It was so cool. It was like an ice bath. It was amazing. And, um, but like, uh, and I appreciated like we, like it was just such a fun moment. And But do you remember, like, in the beginning, your response was like, yes, I'm going to confess that I'm a sin-filled person and I need Jesus. That was our response, too. But then the longer you're away from the water, confession starts to become one of those things where, like, I don't know if I want to talk about that. I mean, even now, when I want to confess something to uh, Chad, one of my dearest friends who you've heard preach before, or, or Eric, who is up in LaGrange, like, even when I reach out to them, it's like, oh, there's something about, even though I'm texting, I'm not even like, hey, I, I've got something to confess. We have a really interesting relationship with confession. It dates all the way back to the Garden of Eden. If you go to Genesis chapter 3, you can see that when God has that parental moment with us in the Garden, 
our natural instinct is to hide as if we can hide from him. But yet, our response to the saving power of Jesus is confession. Uh, one of the verses that I want to look at is 1 John 1.8. This is what 1 John one eight says, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. That is a smack to the face. It's not something I want to read. Because the truth is, the longer we are Christians, it's easier for us to look around us and go, that person has a sinful life, not so much me. Last week, we, uh, two weeks ago, I was here and we played a video and I actually got to meet one of the leaders from Celebrate Recovery. Do you guys know what Celebrate Recovery is? There's usually those in every community. It's a great ministry. And I think we have this view of Celebrate Recovery that probably needs to change this morning. One of my friends, Dave, who's led uh, Celebrate Recovery for a long time, he used to say this to me all the time. He would say, actually, the best thing about being in Celebrate Recovery is there's no hidden sin. We're just broken people. You see, those men and women that have the courage to show up every week, they actually know the secret to living a Jesus-filled life, and that is just to confess. Why? Because if we don't, we're actually claiming to have no sin, and we know the truth of Scripture says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's Romans chapter 3. So we have this interesting relationship with confession because it's so, it feels so awful in the moment. Whether it's a big thing or a small thing, whether our eyes wandered or whether we gossiped about a friend, whether we lost our anger on a family member or we cut somebody off on the way out of church. Can I tell you something? We have this relationship with confession because the only thing we think about is the bad parts of confession, but we need to reverse how we think about confession because this is what 1 John says in one nine, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all righteousness. If you're sitting here this morning and you're wondering, should I follow Jesus? Can I tell you this is the answer why? All those who are in Christ Jesus have the ability to be forgiven until he comes returns and heaven is now part of reality and there is no more sin. You see, from now to eternity, he wants to eliminate the consequence of sin from your life between separating you and God. And he's faithful to forgive those sins and purify you. He doesn't just wipe off the eternal consequence of sin in your life. He wants to actually do something about your sin. Check out what it says in the book of James. James says, Confess your sins to one another so that you may be, what's that word? That's a supernatural word. When Jesus would heal somebody, the blind would see, the paralyzed would walk, demons would leave men. I don't know about you, but I want a supernatural work in my life. And it begins when we confess our sins to one another. The scripture is very clear. He wants to purify us from all sin. He wants to heal us from all sin. He does not want you in that addiction forever. He does not want you to be known by your sin. He wants to rid you of sin. You see, our relationship with confession needs to flip. Instead of it being about, I'm in trouble and I get to receive the consequences, which by the way, in this world, we will have trouble according to Jesus and we do have to face the consequences of the laws of man. We do. But those things do not need to dominate or define who we are in Christ Jesus. You see, one of the greatest freedoms you could have is not trapping the things that you're holding on to privately, but by publicly letting them go to a trusted friend and to a trusted Savior. Because there's a supernatural work that takes place every time we open our mouths and we begin to say, this is what happened. And so our relationship with confession needs to change because for us, confession is hard. So many Christians struggle to confess. It's fascinating. So many of my Catholic friends don't. They understand confession on a deeper level, and it's part of their 
moment by moment faith. But so many of my Christian friends who grew up in churches like I get, we hear about confession, but then we go about our days and we get in the car and then we never say anything ever again. I would tell you that the scriptural norm for our culture as a church should be confession. Our ability to pull a friend aside, whether it's here or whether it's during the week, it should become more normal to say, hey, this is where I started drifting off. You see, when we do that, what we're admitting all over again is why you got baptized in the first place, is that I need Jesus. And the moment we forget that we need Jesus, what does the scripture say? We are denying the truth in our life. And so these sorcerers are not much different than us. Their response to the gospel, the changing power of Jesus is, I need to confess it all because I am not worthy of such truth. But they confess. Maybe the ultimate is what happens when we confess because when Sin is made public. There is a possible of change. In the book of John, there's a story. A story you may have heard of. It's about the story of a woman caught in adultery. And she was literally brought out in front of the ruling body at that time. And the law stated that you should be killed or stoned to death. And if you've not heard the story, you can read about it in John chapter 8. And here's what happens is that Jesus comes on the scene and he shows us the power of grace and truth. You see, when we confess, we get to experience the power of grace and the power of truth. Because here's this woman who's guilty according to the law, and he looks at her and he looks at the men first and he says, if you're without sin, cast the first stone. Oh, how deafening the silence must have been that day. I just think about how those men would have just stopped in their tracks and then like look at each other and like, are you going to, are you, are you? But then verses 10, 12, he looks at the woman and this is what he says. Where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And then don't miss it. When sin is confessed and it goes public, here's grace, the un- unmerited favor of God that we do not deserve. And truth, the change that we should be in one sentence, neither do I, go and sin no more. You see, when we confess our sins to one another, we shall be healed. When we confess what is in our life that's, that's between us and Jesus, and between us and God, do you know what the work is? The work is to experience his grace, but then to also to experience a life that is without that sin. And while there are layers and layers that we need to get rid of in our life, he desires for our life to look more and more like him and less and like like we used to be. Like my desire is to be not the same Johnny today that I am a year from now, not because I have the magic power to do so, but because through the confession of sin, I can allow him to do the work so that I can go and sin no more. That's grace and truth. And so this morning, the challenge is, can you change your relationship with the word confession? Can you make that a normal part of who you are? Because he is faithful to meet you in your confession, to forgive you because he loves you. He's not sitting on a porch up in heaven and he doesn't have his arms crossed and ready to make shame fill your life. Shame is not God's design. It's ours. Shame entered the garden not because of God, but because of us. When we feel shame, that is not a tool of God trying to convict your soul. Actually, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's job is to guide us into all truth according to to the words of Jesus. And so when we feel shame, that's not God sitting here going, man, I hope you feel bad about what you've done. Because God actually thinks it's more powerful for you to realize what he's done for you when you confess that that will transform you. See, the more we lean into grace, it should change our lives. Would you join me this morning in changing your relationship with confession? Because I need a change in my relationship with confession because I still hesitate in moments to say out loud what's happening. I've been a pastor for a long time and one of the things in my early 20s that I had to come to grips with is that it's just different, y'all. There, the scriptures say there's an expectation difference, and there is, but it is harder to talk about the junk in your life when you preach the word of God. You don't want to be called a hypocrite. You don't want people to find out. And so what happens is so many pastors get trapped, and they don't know where to turn because they have unconfessed things in their life. 
It's a challenge of every pastor at every church. Even publicly, you're seeing right now the struggle with that. And I'm so thankful at 25 years old when my really good friend Dave said, hey, uh, I want to go plant a church. You go plant a church with me. And I was like, yeah, I want to go plant a church. And so we sat down at Starbucks to have a meeting about planting a church in Charlotte, North Carolina, a church that's still there today. And I was 25 years old. My marriage was starting out not so good, but we didn't want anybody to know about that. In fact, we moved from Chicago down to Louisville so that we could just kind of like forget about it. Until that day at Starbucks when Dave looked at me and he said, hey, you can't come with me. And I was like, what? I can't go with you, why? Because your marriage is a mess, isn't it? And I could feel that moment burning inside of me and I had to open my mouth and say, yeah, and he goes, tell me. And I didn't feel shame in that moment. I felt the arms of a friend wrap around me and say, hey, thank you for sharing why your marriage is a mess. The addictions that you're battling, the depression your wife is under. Let's, let's work together and pray through this. If you're a believer in this room, one of your responses to confession, by the way, that James taught us there is to prayer. If you're wondering, what do I do when someone says to me, I have this in my life? You don't have to come up with the battle plan. You can walk alongside somebody to find the help they need, or you can just hold them accountable. But really, it begins with, hey, I love you, I want to pray for you. That's why I love my friend Eric and my friend Chad that you've experienced, because when I confess my sins again, here's what I feel. I feel the love of the Lord back, not the shame of Satan. And I'm compelled to tell them more so that I can allow him to do the work that he wants to do so I can go and sin no more. And this is the circle that we should continue as believers until Christ returns because there's more and more layers to get rid of. We need to change our relationship with confession. Let's go back into Acts chapter 19. I want to continue back in that. We read the whole thing before, but I want to see the response. And there's a few questions that the scriptures are going to ask us out of this moment. A number of them have been practicing sorcery, brought their incantations in books. It's like a Harry Potter moment. And burned them all at a public bonfire. The value of the books was several million dollars. Jesus enters their life, and there's a cost. And so, here's my next question. Has your faith cost you anything? Has your faith cost you anything? You see, it's clear when they met the gospel, Jesus changed their life and they were willing to give up anything that was between them and having the relationship with Jesus that they should have. And I think one of the things that's easy to do as believers, the longer we're alive, is that cost gets less and less and less. Yeah, we tithe sometimes when it hurts. Yeah, we we sacrifice some days for church events. But the longer we're alive, that cost decreases. But if you go back and you remember to some of the first moments when you came out of that water, you were willing to give up all kinds of things because you knew the transforming power of Jesus. You would listen to different music. You would uh, change your conversations. You're willing to, uh, you know, cuss less. You know, you were willing to like do all these things. You're like, maybe I should address some habits in my life. But the longer we go, there's this declining balance of change. But we've got to come back to the truth of these sorcerers, which we're not much different in. They saw evil and they walked away from it. What are the things that our faith needs to cost us? Not just our time and our money. What are the freedoms that we need to give up so we can experience the freedom of Jesus? Maybe, maybe on a real basic level, we need to start here. Because I have to tell you straight up that I have had a lifelong battle with this thing. There are days I really love it and there's days I really hate it. There are days when it's the master and I'm the servant. We have allowed certain things to become the norm that should never have been the norm. And therefore now our lives have actually less freedom than the more freedom we think it's giving us. I wonder if there are some things that we need to cut off even here so that we can experience the freedom of Christ. Maybe our faith needs to cost us something here first because this is what's in front of us every single day. 
the number of times this has been the root cause behind something is far too great. Even in my own life, I've had to re-examine the role of social media. And in my world, like I, I grew up with social media, but I have to tell you something, it's gotten to the point now where it's like it's not what it used to be. In fact, if you talk to anybody who were on social platforms before today, like way back when, everything has changed. And so my wife and I have active conversations about some of the freedoms I need to give up on my phone. I actually no longer have the ability to install an app anymore. She has that ability because the truth is there were too many things that were distracting me and taking me down a path too far. Men, I have to tell you straight up, one of the things that's going to make this room uncomfortable that I need you to know is that I was on Instagram way too much. I had this hobby of sending my wife 30 reels every night because it was fun because I was really good at it. I found the very best. I'm the curator of all curators. Like I could blow you up with the best of the best. I know how to swipe and send. I know how to swipe and send. But can I tell you that every 15 reels, something would be suggested to me that I should never have laid eyes on? And, and here's the dangerous part. As innocent as that was, when you're like, who is this and why is it on my feed? And you click the profile, here's what I saw. I saw men that I know who are part of my believing circle and the extended family, and they were following that person. And I was like, I need to run. And that was the day that Instagram and I had a divorce. My wife has it. Somebody needs to get hold of me. Great. And you're like, well, that's, that's pretty lame. Is it though? Because the world says you have to have this platform and this thing and this thing and this thing to keep up. But maybe the cost needs to be that we give up what the world is saying for us to have in order for us to truly be free. In order to find freedom in Jesus, you actually have to give up freedom on earth. And maybe the cost needs to be some of the things that we just have access to left and right. Here's the last big question that I want to ask you this morning is that has anything changed with Jesus? Has anything changed? One of the biggest reasons why when I was a student pastor for so many years that students and their parents and some of their friends never wanted to share Jesus with others is they were either A, afraid, or they weren't sure what to say. And one of the reasons the longer we go that it's hard to tell people about Jesus is that we truly have nothing to tell them. I mean, the truth is our lives look pretty close to the way they were when we first got baptized and we started attending church. Why in the world would anybody take a look, a serious look at the gospel if it looks no different than the rest of life? If it's so freely caught up in the emotions of the moment to join the world in all the arguments instead of joining Jesus in the kindness of his love. You see, the world is hungry for something different right now. They're starving for a difference. The only problem is if you aren't changed, you have nothing to share with them except the truth, which is I need Jesus. This morning, I just want to ask the question, has anything changed? Because those sorcerers, their lives changed at that moment. Do you realize that their jobs changed? They gave up everything to start following Jesus. A commotion was stirred up because of what happened that day. What is the last thing that Jesus changed in your life? Because I promise you this, he wants to do it again. He wants to change you again and again and again. And if you are sitting in this place and you have flatlined with your faith, I want to remind you and I want to tell you something that's okay, bring it to Jesus because he's ready to turn that flat line into some peaks and valleys that you've never experienced before. He's ready to revive you and awaken you to some things that you've never even considered before. He is interested in transformation. In fact, look at what Ephesians 2 says, because I think this sums up what we're saying today. I want to read Ephesians 2, because the the first part is who we are. Once you were dead, because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers of the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us, all of us. We can no longer delineate and say some of us, all of us used to live that way, following the passion desires 
and inclinations of our sinful nature. But by our very nature, we were subject to God's anger just like everyone else. That is who we were. But there's hope because here's how the rest of it speaks of those in Christ Jesus. Check out the rest of this. But God, in so rich in mercy, he loved us so much that he, that though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. You and I do not have the power to behave differently enough to earn heaven. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. That is a transformation that should be taking place in our lives. Has anything changed with Jesus because he meant it to change? We were once dead, now we're alive. His love is stronger than any sin in this room. And he's ready to do it again. We're about to go into a time of communion. And, and I want to kind of, as we do that, we've got some stations if you didn't get the bread and the juice. And you know what stunned me the most that day when I walked into Bilo Foods that I also remember? I was filled with tears and I'm looking up because everybody when you're a kid is giants. And I just remember looking up at that manager and I remember him saying, thank you. And he gave it back to me. A fully wrapped whistle pop. And he says, you don't have to pay for this. It's on me. That blew my mind. Jesus, through his death and resurrection, he gives back to you a life that you do not deserve. And he says, you don't have to pay for this. This is my blood. This is my body. And I poured it out for you. He said it at the Last Supper around the disciples, and he's saying it this morning. This morning, maybe communion time is a chance for you to confess. Maybe you have a spouse with you, a friend, and maybe you need to pull them aside and stop doing the ritual of communion that you may have fallen into and actually experience communion for what it is and confess something. And maybe you're like at that place where you're at a flat line of faith and you're like, really, can you do it again? He died so he could do it again. You have the spirit of God living inside of you. He's ready to resurrect anything in your life. So maybe this morning, maybe you need to hit your knees. I know that's uncomfortable and you're like, who would look at me? But maybe you just need to say, hey, do it again. You don't have to have the words. Or maybe it's time for some transformation. Maybe it's time to experience the cost of your faith all over again. And maybe today you're like, hey, God, will you show me something that I can let go of for the sake of your name? Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you so much that you um, give us the opportunity and the hope and the chance to to be transformed through the power of confession, through the power of the cost of, of being with you, giving things up in order to experience the freedom in you. Lord, I just, I know in this room, it's easy to walk in and out of here and not be known, but I pray they're known to you. Maybe this morning, Lord, you can awaken in their lives something brand new because of your love. You died and resurrected, and you loved us so much that you said this, this new life is not something you can pay for. It's something that only I can give to you, and I give it to you freely. Enter into this time of communion with us, Jesus, in your name I pray. Amen.